Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, here we are again, episode 35 of the Journey of Integral Recovery, and we have a really, really exciting show and an exciting guest. And this is a young, amazing, talented, gifted, beautiful woman that I have known for, it's been a few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's done some extraordinary things and started a, a site and a community called Hip Sobriety. Well, let me introduce Dr. Bob. Hi, doctor. Uh, hi, Bob. Hello, everybody. Hi. And, uh, hi. This, again, is Douglas Prater, our producer and co-podcaster. So this is a team. And, well, welcome, Holly. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. for having me, guys. It's great to have you, Holly. Good to see yeah. you. Good and uh, so we can kind of cut through the chase and kind of set the foundation. Doug, you have a, a, a bio to read, so we can kind of just sense into what, we're, what we've got here. Sure. You guys, you guys are going to love Holly. Uh, she is a professional sobriety coach and teacher. She is a writer, speaker, and is also the co-host, co-producer of the Home Podcast. You guys should check it out if you haven't. Um, Kundalini yoga and meditation instructor, and she runs something called Hip Sobriety. Her life's mission is to fix the mess that is addiction and addiction recovery. She is one of many who believes that we must end the stigma, shame, criminalization, and marginalization and promote alternative pathways to recovery and work together across a diverse set of belief systems, modalities, and barriers in order to do that. Um, Holly loves photography, travel, and dancing naked by herself, so do we all. <laughs> Hot beverages, <laughs> yoga and yoga pants, meditation and metaphysics. Um, chanting in, is it Gurmukhi? Gurmukhi. Gurmukhi. Red lipstick, perfect outfits, staying up late and waking up early, walking through cities, staring up at the sky, flying in planes, and reading nonfiction. Her heart wow. is three times as big as she can handle most of the time. She's yeah. terrible with time management. I don't know anything about that, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to learn to... Please wants to learn sorry, to, keep going. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Holly wants to learn to fly airplanes. That sounds awesome. And she's obsessed with Bloomberg Business Week, Social Justice, Design Elements, Instagram, Italy, Papa Francesco, things Oprah does, and her hair. Holly believes <laughs> deeply that sobriety is an inspiring, empowering, and life-affirming choice, and that we are living in such a time where more and more individuals will decide for it. And mm -hmm. Holly, we agree. We're delighted to have you here. Yeah. Wow, that is so long. Uh, that is a very long bio. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was so delightful. That's one of the best bios I've ever heard. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. It's really old. I actually, like a lot of it still holds true, but I wrote that about three years ago. Um, I would have sent you a much more concise one, but that's great. Now you guys know everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Holly, um, you know, anyway, I would just like to talk, why did you get to creating and doing what you're doing. Normally, I mean, it's like, if you can't see what you want in the world and a particular thing, you have to just step up and do it yourself. And I have a sense that that's kind of what uh, you did in creating this, but how did, how did you get to the point where you're doing all you're doing in the world and being a leader and a guide and an inspiration for so many people at this point? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's one of those things that happened. I mean, I was in 2012, I was working as a professional. I was the director, um, I, my background was in accounting. And I was working at a healthcare startup and I was, uh, I was dying. I mean, I, I had a really severe eating disorder. I was, I was drinking. I mean, I was addicted to alcohol. I was addicted to drugs. I was addicted to cigarettes. I was just, a, I was so sick in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I turned to the healthcare system and the healthcare system didn't know how to help me. And it was, it was you know, for me at the time, I didn't identify as an alcoholic. And that's something that's so interesting is that most people, when they're like it, it, when they are sick, they still don't identify as being this in spectrum case that they see on like, you know, Law and Order. And so for me, I was not an alcoholic, and I was told by a doctor who was not trained in addiction medicine, as most doctors aren't, yeah. that I could go to the twelve steps and or I could go to rehab, and it was just laughable. And you know, it was just a, one of these things that it was just it, neither one of those were options for me, and so. I turned to, I mean, I had a very interesting path. I found Alan Carr's work really early on. Alan Carr is like the founder of the easy way methods. He started with helping people to use uh, subconscious reasoning and uh, basically to, to uh, it's something Anna Grace calls, calls luminal thinking, but just working with our subconscious beliefs to help us to quit smoking. And then he turned that on alcohol. And he wrote one book and it's called Easy Way to Control Alcohol. And for me, that was the end because I was looking, I, I felt, uh, I was certain I had a mental illness. That's what I thought was, was the, the root of this. I thought I was, I was um, 
not bipolar. Why can't I even think of it? Um, borderline. I thought I had borderline mm-hmm. personality disorder. I had, it's really like when you take one of those tests online, it really mimics uh, addiction. And so I was eight out of nine for a borderline personality test that I, okay. that I took on the internet. Okay. And for me, it was just one of these, it was an opening to look at my relationship with alcohol and realize it. And I had this, this very rational thought of if I keep drinking, then I will get more, I will, I will become even, even more mentally ill. And so that was my in was being terrified mm-hmm. that I was developing mm-hmm. psychosis. And so I found Alan Carr's book and it was called Control Alcohol. And for me, that was easier than not drinking. It was mm-hmm. like, oh, there's an easy way to control alcohol. And the, you know, the punchline of the book is that the only way to control alcohol is to not consume it. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> he, and so I read this and it just changed my perspective on alcohol entirely. I was very happy to, I was excited to stop drinking. I had been drinking, uh, binge drinking. I started binge drinking when I was 15 and I had never had an easy relationship with alcohol. I wasn't addicted in the sense uh, that I was when I finally quit, you know, for years, but I had always had this very contentious relationship and this very fearful relationship with alcohol. And so for me, it was this like moment of like, oh my God, I don't have to drink. That was the flip mm-hmm. was I don't have to do this thing, that a better life is on the other side of not drinking. And so I did that and I didn't do anything else. And I got, uh, I started drinking just a couple months later. And so this- And were you still smoking cigarettes at this point? Oh yeah. I mean, I was like, it wasn't anything else. It was just the alcohol. It was just removing the alcohol, which is good enough as far as I'm concerned. But I was still smoking a lot of pot. I was still smoking cigarettes. I was still binging and purging. I mean, I had a major, major uh, eating disorder. I was, I would, you know, it, which got worse um, as I removed alcohol. But Mm -hmm. so January, 2013, I hit this moment in time and I'm just, uh, I've, I'm sicker than I was when I started in October, 2012, when I found Alan Carr's work and I found another, and I found meditation and I found a course in miracles. And I found, I had been reading Eckhart Tolle. I'd started to have this opening. I had started going to church. These things were shifting in my life. And so I, I had this invitation, right? Like in October, 2012, I, I just surrendered it in some way. And in between that time, I just was, I was led to these different things. And so in January, 2013, I really took it seriously and I threw myself into meditation, Kundalini yoga, um, metaphysics, Course in Miracles, reading and doing everything to save my life. And then I stopped drinking again using Alan Carr's method in, in April 2013. And and I was successful at it. I used like this specific formula between therapists and doctors, acupuncture. Um, I, I mean, I used everything you could possibly imagine. I, it was my full-time job to pull myself out of a hell I'd been in for 20 something years, you know, depression, Mm -hmm. anxiety, addiction. Um, and I had this moment, um, where I, not this moment, but I, it kept on getting better. And and by the end of 2013, I I stopped binging and purging. And on January 19th, 2014, I stopped smoking pot and cigarettes and doing all recreational drugs. And then I was in Italy in 2014 and, and I quit my job at this point. Like I quit my job, Um, But just to kind of like put it succinctly, I knew I had to do something with what I had found working in the healthcare industry and seeing how limited the healthcare industry was and that so many sick people turn to it and and look like me and don't identify as an addict and don't identify as an alcoholic and don't want to go to a church basement and want a more holistic recovery and want something that can see them as a human. Um, I, I was on this mission to somehow help other people find what I had found yeah. I didn't know how to do it though. And that's kind of where your work comes in and where you come into this, which is I, in 2014, I'm in Italy and I'm trying to figure out why I was, why in a year I had so easily, I mean, very, it was a lot of hard work, but I had overcome very successfully these things that had been killing me and killed so many other people. And I was at a cafe and I read, I started reading your book, which was recommended mm-hmm. to me by Chris Grosso. Grosso. And I just codified why it had worked for me it like mm-hmm. it was the integral map right like yep. i had what i had done unintentionally was work on my internal world my relationships my environment i mean i did everything by the book um and and it was and my physical self i had done everything by the book and this was like for me this is this like this very big aha moment of 
not only like I knew the why, I knew why I wanted to do the work and I knew why I wanted to talk because I felt there was a missing voice, um, you know, that, that I needed to hear, but I didn't know the how, how to help people like bridge this and, and your map and, and your work was, mm -hmm. was, um, it was a big deal, right? It was just, mm -hmm. a, it showed me exactly why I had gotten well. And, um, and yeah, so, I mean, it was just, I had started hip sobriety in 2000, I started blogging in 2013, but it was this developing course of understanding that I had something that very, there was some huge passion inside of me to, to never have another girl like me go through what I went through again. And not only that, like for, for us to, to not have to wait until we're binging and purging five bags of food a day and we're drinking two to three bottles of wine a night um, to actually intervene and say, there is a better way. Like there is another way to live. You know, we catch addiction when people are on their floor. We don't catch it when people are, are just in that state of sliding off the cliff. And yeah. so it was just, uh, I knew that this was my life's work. Um, mm -hmm. And I was right. <laughs> wow. Thank you. There's, man, I, first of all, I just want to I I weep, stand up and cheer. And um, there's so much in there. I, I just want to, yeah. <laughs> because I'm not an expert in, in, in the, the food, the binging and purging and the, and the food disorders. And I've run into them a lot in my life, my professional life, especially in young women. Uh, how did you, how did you overcome that? What did you do that? that, well, I mean, that? And what, what, what was it doing for you while you were doing it? I mean, what was the purpose behind it? Yeah, I did. I tended towards numbing out. Like that was my thing. Well, some people have different, you know, like we find, find different fits and mm -hmm. binging and purging pot and, and drinking all satiated this need for me to, I'm very, I'm a, High energy. I've got a lot going on. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my my baseline. My one of my teachers says my baseline is very. It, her baseline is agitated, slightly agitated. And that's my baseline. My baseline is slightly agitated. And so for me, I wouldn't be able to stop, and I'd have to take myself out of the game. And pot worked really well, and so did binging and purging. Mm -hmm. So there's this one side of it is that it just worked on the kind of person that I am. But um, eating disorder is common for a lot of reasons. I mean, we work, we live in a patriarchal society and women are, women's value is, is, I mean, no offense. You said at the beginning of this, Holly's a beautiful woman. And when I introduce men on my show, I don't introduce them as handsome. You know, women mm -hmm. are inherently like their value is inherently tied to their looks. And so we, yeah. from a very young age are in a society that tells <clears> us our <throat> value is like, is based on, on how we look. And so there's that yeah. piece of it. Yeah. And then also there is, you know, eating disorders is the first chakra thing meaning like you know whether or not you know anything about the chakras there is just a, a very very basic need for us to be able to mother ourselves survival is based on this idea of nurture and most of us are, are raised especially in american society um with a disconnection from that nurturing whether we didn't yeah. receive it as a young child mm -hmm. or whether we can't give it to ourselves this is it's usually like a very uh it's a pathological thing and so for me um, I didn't have the nurturing down. I hated my body. I had never liked my body. I had been told when in the fifth grade, my, I had the nickname Big Butts, uh, cottage cheese from, a, you know, from puberty. And, um, and I just had, I had developed a lifetime of believing that our worth is based on fitting into size zero jeans. And so I did everything I could in my power to fit into size zero jeans, as well as I happened to really enjoy the benefits of shoving, you know, loaves of bread and butter down my throat and then puking back up. That was catharsis for me. It felt mm -hmm. really good to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for me, overcoming that came from starting to mother myself and nurture myself, right? Like as part of the, like the same things I did to stop drinking were the same things I did to stop benching and purging were the same things I did to stop smoking mm -hmm. pot were the same things I did to stop using men, you know, to, to mm -hmm. escape myself and, and my codependent tendencies. And so mm -hmm. it's just this, it was, uh, it was, uh, it came to a point where I just said, I can't, I can't do like the same reason I, I stopped drinking. I told myself I'm going to stop drinking. I'm never going to question whether that was a good decision or not. I'm just going to stop doing it. I removed binge, I removed purging from the equation. So I yeah. sometimes still binge a little bit, but, mm. and I still hate my ass. I still like hate my kneecaps and like, like I still have the like mm -hmm. neurosis around this that I, I don't know any woman that doesn't have it, yeah. but I'm not in, uh, I'm not 
in the cycle of doing it anymore because I feel a lot better. And I, and I also love myself a lot more. A, a couple of things. Yeah. We have our own version of that men, you know, we were uh, growing up looking at magazines of people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and all these people as, as the, the, the ideal of masculine uh, bodies. And these guys are all massive amounts of steroids and yeah. ironically, it shrinks your, your genitalia. And everything. I mean, it's like you're actually less of a man, but that's the model, you know? And I think that shifted a little bit, you know, like uh, Bruce Lee, to me, he was just a beautiful a model of a physical fitness without this huge puffy mm-hmm. face. And, and you've seen women too that have used the same kind of drugs and they have these masculine jaws and they shave and it's just this, oh God, it's bad. But men, believe me, um, a little insecure boys men growing up, well, man, we got our stuff too. Yeah, you like there's a very I think where men and women are conditioned very differently into these roles, right? We're very like we're conditioned into this ma- men are conditioned into this masculine role and they're, they're supposed to not show emotion and women are conditioned into this this, this submissive servant role. And it's you know, we're all we're all screwed. <laughs> yeah, and God forbid if you're a feminine man, you know, then then you you know, then you're in a whole other firing range. Well, what what are some of the t- techniques that you use to nurture yourself? To, to, to to work with some of this stuff. How long you got? Um, it was, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that this is a full time job at first. My number mm-hmm. one job was recovering myself and healing myself. And so, um, when it's your number one job, and that's that's really like the thing that you prioritize over all other things. Um, it's everything, you know. I mean, it's from like the bed clothes that I wear, you know, like the like just like the the, the way I treat myself when I go to bed. It's from the like the baths I take, you know, I, I diffused essential oils. Um, I try and eat whole foods. Um, I allow myself to say no, I erected boundaries. Um, I mean, there's, there's at least a thousand ways. Um, but the primary ways, uh, were just, um, treating myself, like treating myself, Uh like just putting myself first. There's a lot of stigma around the idea that, that like there is, I don't use, I don't call people addicts, but there is this very, like, there is this, this idea that addicts are selfish. And, um, and, and I was not, I was sick, not because I was so selfish. I was mm-hmm. sick because I had no sense of self. Yeah. And so for yeah. me, a lot of this came into saying no and allowing myself to take care of myself um, and create a, a sense of self. Um, yeah. So that yeah. was it, you could, you know, you name it. I tried it. Then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet because I know these guys have, have questions and comments and I just feel like you're really compelling. And, and, uh, uh anyway, so I'm going to back off for a second and, and Doug or Bob. On this last point, uh, Holly, it's great to see you, by the way. Thank I you. Know, your crazy. energy and your, br- your brilliance, your quickness. I just, I love your agitation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm an agitated little boy myself. So there, yeah. there you have it. But, uh, uh, I, I, I'm involved in refuge recovery locally, and I, I really great. appreciate it. And we have a, a group with with primarily men. It's a book study, and 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 uh, uh, women, just a handful of women, come to it. But <clears throat> they've made it really clear, and it's been really uh, illuminating to me is that the whole focus in AA and twelve steps, and I I, I was deeply involved in that early on. Uh, with problems, but I still did it anyway, and yeah. uh, continue to have some 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 involvement in it. The languaging is so. Uh, I, I know that you know this, but the languaging is so biased towards white privileged males, and the idea that you need to diminish the self in order to really achieve lasting sobriety. And it's been very helpful to me. One of the members of the group who comes in from a background in eating disorders and now works in the treatment of eating disorders talked about her own treatment program and it was just the absolute 180 degree reverse of that and it's really what you just said which is rather you 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 can't vanquish the self if you don't have one and so that language is absolutely contraindicated not only for for women but i i'm going to own up as a man having such a so impoverished a sense of self that 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 language is really not helpful it's actually undermining of what needs to happen so i really want to affirm what you just said about about becoming a self and then and then fine tuning that and so you know it's right. like yeah yeah so I, mean, I just i have such a powerful personal response to that in affirmation of you 
Holly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think John said it so perfectly when in, in his book and he talks about how the, you know, there's AA is a really masculine approach and yeah, and yeah. there is, it neglects this idea of what some people need when, when they are, you know, it, it really assumes you have an overdeveloped ego. I wrote a piece about this recently called mm, why we need to do away with ego deflation and humility and women's recovery because right there's on. this sense that women need to humble themselves more and women, you know, that that we have this overinflated sense of self and and often what women need when they're coming into recovery and I can't speak for men but I can speak for some men. I mean I have definitely worked sure. with men but but I'll say like just from a very specific feminine let's say feminine regardless of gender but fem- the yes. people with an overdeveloped feminine self or <clears> that <throat> tend towards a, a, a feminine um the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for it's not it's not it's not a type it's um John help me with this uh, it's, it's, um, I just I think of it. yeah I think of, of the distinction that's made between biological gender and right. and feminine a feminine or masculine identity it's like I'm identity. a dinner yeah 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 <clears throat> yeah and, and people that come in that really absolutely need to build that sense before and exactly like you said fine-tune it's not that like I don't have to worry about my yeah. ego and it's not that I don't believe in humility they do believe when i'm first coming into this if i'm told immediately i as i've already been telling myself for years i'm not good enough um i don't belong i'm you know just i have all of it i've been telling myself for years and taking in society's viewpoint for years of what's wrong with me i can tell you exactly what's wrong with me i do not need to sit there and actually catalog it and so for me it's a matter of actually developing more of a sense of self rather than like rejecting stuff as i've always, yeah. always yeah. been doing and then once I have that, like, I'm not afraid of women becoming, having an overdeveloped ego, right? Like, I think that's the farthest thing we need to worry about because by the time they <laughs> do this so work, true. they start to invite the spirituality in that allows them to use their own determ- like their own gut sense and their own, their own yeah. like higher sense to fine tune that. I know when it doesn't feel good, when I'm not be- when I'm not practicing humility, I know what that feels yeah. like. And I know yeah, how to too. correct that. I don't need to have that smashed over my head. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And I think that's probably because of the, um, you know, AA came out of very Christian kind of evangelical nexus. And I was involved in evangelical born again, Christianity in my teens. And so I know that world. Yeah. And it was always about humility before God and, you know, your not being your voice and, you know, leaning to your own understanding. And, and some, sometimes that, 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 um, that seeps over, you know, and, and we all have masculine and feminine parts, right? And the, un, and the beat up feminine needs power and strength and limit setting and a sense of self. And the unhealthy male needs to like, Hey dude, it's not all about you. <laughs> it's not, Ching, you know, it's a revelation, you know, so get away from the self-obsessed yeah. narcissism. So, and, That's the you know, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and the gender thing, you know, gender is kind of what you feel like. And I may have all the plumbing of a man, but I feel like a woman. That's, you know, yeah. then there's sexual preference. And, you know, I'm a man, I'm attracted to men or women or whatever it is. And so it's a very complex thing. And it does certainly figure into the work that we're doing. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Holly, but you're such I, a strong voice for the feminine. I so appreciate that. God bless you. It's really, it's really clarifying and, and beautiful uh, and beautiful, not, and just in a physical sense. And by the way, I call these guys beautiful men all the time. And I think they are beautiful men physically too, but I had a woman uh, emailed us and said, you know, you guys, I just love it. You have these three men who obviously love each other and you express so much love and kindness. It's not a sexual thing, but just to see men doing that is, is really uh, inspiring. That was one of the sweetest things I've heard mm-hmm. from about our our work in this yeah. podcast together. No, it wasn't a comment on you per se. It was just a comment on. No, and you're right. And then I checked like, myself. And I went, something that I, I would typically say. And I think yeah. it's really, it's, 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 but it is also something I get. If you understand, like as a woman. Yeah, totally. It's totally. Point, how I'm introduced. Point taken. Level. Point taken. Absolutely. <laughs> no, right on. Douglas. Holly, I uh, really appreciate what you're saying here around the issues of strength of sense of self. Um, you actually have said a lot of things that have resonated with me and, and that I would like to, but I struggled with the 12 step program in the traditional sense with AA for much the same reason in that I had no sense of self, my, my self-worth, my self-esteem were all so down low that I didn't need that to be reduced any further. It did not work for me. I had to find a sense of self and, and strengthen that in order to make recovery happen. Um, also, very much like you, I 
stumbled into recovery almost by accident. I had put together all these pieces of the integral map um, really by trial and error. And it wasn't until all of them came together at once outside the context of AA that I was able to make recovery happen and make it stick. Um, mm. And I'm involved in this work for the same reason that I don't want other people to have to suffer that way and go through that because, you know, masculine, feminine, male, female, we all have our stuff and we are all coming to all these different components of the aqua map from different places. And we need to build this complete holistic picture. So I really admire what you're doing. Um, very much appreciate to the uh, comment you made about, the expectation, the the inherent kind of cultural bias that women are judged on their value of beauty. I'm a, the father to a young daughter, and we're very, very conscious of that. My wife, fortunately, is um, very well informed about these kind of things and very progressive in her orientation. So we're doing everything we can to help her build a sense of self-worth that is based on other things to try and eliminate some of these problems along the way. And what you're doing by reaching out and helping people make these changes in their lives in part is to help influence the way we relate to the next generation and and by extension the rest of the world around us to be yeah. healthier and better and it's complicated for certain and the work you're doing around it is just beautiful i respect it very much Thank you. I had a thought here I wanted to toss in as I was listening to you, Doug. I see what you guys think about this. It started with you talking about uh, your own uh, healing, uh, Holly, and the way that you were referencing uh, implicitly the quadrants. And I wonder, this is a radical statement, you guys, but I want to see what you think about this. With all due respect to the 12 steps, and we've all had our dance with it uh, personally and professionally, is that if you look at the upper left-hand quadrant, uh, the twelve step program is really pre psychological for the most part it it doesn 't it, it doesn 't have advantage of the last eighty years of psychological uh, development and research and there 's been so much it 's monumental in the field of psychotherapy, much less in terms of how that would apply to recovery. If you go across the way, we were just talking earlier holly that this uh, this month 's cover of uh, National Geographic is the science of addiction I and it's it. and it 's extraordinarily well presented don 't you think of the diagrams and so on but it 's there it is right there is that AA and the 12 step movement. It's also pre medical or pre scientific uh, right. as, as is most, most of the work that was done in psychology on addiction. And up to the last 20 years, we didn't have the advantage of brain scan and that whole article is about brain scan research. And so yeah. there's that piece. And if you drop down in the lower left-hand quadrant, uh, AA is pre ecumenical. It's really very much uh, Christianized uh, owing to its background. And so it doesn't have the advantage of drawing on world religious traditions in terms of a more of an ecumenical, open-minded approach. And if you go across to the lower right-hand quadrant from a kind of a social structural perspective, it's also pre-gender conscious. There wasn't, there wasn't gender awareness until the 60s or 70s, really. And, and so if you just think about it, you, you, can, you can see the value of it. But my goodness, in all four quadrants, it's uh, of necessity. Historically, it's contextualized. It was developed in the 1930s. It's pre, 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 and pre. And so we need to grow it up. And I think that's what we're talking yeah. about here. And I think, it's, I think like AA works for two, I think, two, two great reasons. One, there's, there's structure and foundation, right? Yes. You know, certain people need that absolute structure right at the beginning yeah, of recovery, yeah. especially yeah. if they are far regressed. And then there's also the community aspect of it. And that's why it that's proliferates big. because you yeah. can walk into any city, anywhere in the world and right. go and find a meeting and it's going right. to be, it's going to have the same book in it. And yep. so it works for, you know, for some, for some very like basic and wonderful reasons. And, and it's yeah. also one of these things that I think like a lot of people want to move towards demonizing. Um, and I think it's, it's really important. We just did a podcast about this. It's really important to be able to talk about it critically rather than to think that, that like, like all things, like all paradigms, like John's work could be talked about, spoken about critically. And we wouldn't, Absolutely. you know, at the root of it, be set, be, be, threatening anybody's sobriety because of our critiques towards towards mm -hmm. an infrastructure mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i think one thing that i always like to remember when i'm talking about it mm -hmm. is that we're exactly right it was built in the it was it was put together in the 1930s two white men two very privileged white men it wasn't for women at first 
right? There's a chapter called For the Wives. Um, and, then, and then also, like, when it was medicalized, when Jelinek's work was studied and when it became adopted in the American Asso uh, Medical Association yep. and, and recognized as a disease, this is in the 50s. Now, if you actually take that and you contextualize it, in the 1950s, they performed, I think it was 1954, they performed their last prefrontal lobotomy. Right. This was when they were drilling holes in schizophrenics' brains. Yes. Like just literally drilling holes. Yes. Yeah. Um. And so this is like you like w this is where we were at, and people accepted that as as a as a as a medical yeah. practice. Yeah. yeah. And so when you take it and you look at that, and then you realize it also has is spoken about as a disease in that context of right. chronic relapsing, you know, um, forever disease um, mm -hmm. that extends into every other area of your life. Well, if you're an alcoholic, then you're also, you know, prone, like that's your alcoholism talking and all of right, that. Right, right. Like right. it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that absolutely needs to be reviewed and expanded upon. I don't think AA gets thrown out. I think AA mm -hmm. just, because it's not going to change and a lot of people for the sake of it don't want to change, like for the fundamental right. aspects of it, the, yeah, the work yeah. as it's written, don't want to change it. But what needs yeah. to happen Happen is people that are in this program also need to be invited into I think that integral recovery is a complement not an alternative it can I agree. be complimented fully agree fully agree yeah fully you're, you're, you're channeling Ken Wilber his new book uh, the religion of tomorrow talks just about that you, yeah. we we don't want to do away with in religion but we need to add this on to make it effective you know yeah. that's right yeah. and also yeah. be able to speak about it a lot of times people get so emotional there's this idea especially in aa there's this idea that if you threaten the institution i've received letters from people that if you if you like you know people are so weak-minded and you know mm -hmm. they can't be trusted and if you start throwing into this idea that they don't have to be labeled alcoholics and that they can think for themselves, you know, right. or, or tell them that, you know, like that they don't have to keep coming back or whatever it is that gets mm -hmm. drilled into people, which is fear-based, you know, yeah. then you're taking somebody else's sobriety away. And right. we have to right. be able to trust that humans can actually, it, they can, they can actually challenge their beliefs and yeah. not die. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And I, and think I feel like, I, I feel such a burden for those that go to AA, leave and die. And so I feel also a really fierce advocacy for those for whom it's not an adequate container. God bless those that are contained within the fundamentalism, let's say within religion, but I'm not one of those and I will languish and die if there's not a bigger container. And so that it would be included absolutely, but that that would be the, that that would be uh, subsumed by a, a growing model always. I absolutely need that. And I, I feel like there's other Bob Weathers out there that will, will lose their ass and die if there's not a not a voice like yours holly not a voice like integral recovery i feel really uh, unapologetically affirming of uh, other other languages of this yeah, and the, really the whole great. anonymity thing i think uh, maybe the 1930s and maybe beyond it had a, there was a purpose and i under i get it i get it i get it but i think now at least in the modern world not in some country or culture world or you know they'll cut your head off or whatever if you know i mean can i understand that but now it's like enough already you know it is us nobody's you know one two degrees removed from this disease it's in our families it's us it's our our coworkers, our friends, our culture, our, you know, it's our there was a, There was a study done last year in the United States, and you'll be aware of it too, Holly, that, that uh, was a large-scale study that 90% of adult Americans agree that it, they're currently right now have at least one behavioral addiction. And I figure the other 10% are just lying or didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is absolutely society. freaking universal. <laughs> yeah, we live in a society that tells us that it's not safe within, that we need to go out and use external things in order for us to, in order for us to manage our lives. We live in yeah. a very, like in a society yeah. that pulls us out of our center and people are yeah. addicted to power yeah. and status yeah. and money and things. Yeah. And so it may not be the clinical chemical addiction. It may not be right. even the clinical process addiction, but people are like, mm -hmm. everyone's addicted to something. Like, yes. you, unless you are yeah. like, I don't know, like, un unless you are whatever, the Dalai Lama, he's probably yeah. okay. One of, one, of, one of our fellow friends here, and you remember him, we had a long drive together with Guy Duplessis. Mm -hmm. Guy and I have been in yeah. conversation. He's working in South Africa right now, uh, very seriously, uh, actually thinking of doing a doctoral dissertation on addiction to ideology, which I think is oh, yeah. freaking brilliant. Addiction <laughs> to ideology. No kidding. No kidding. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> now, there was something that I was going to say when... Um, 
John, you were just talking and I can't remember what it was exactly. But How about anonymous and anonymity? Yeah, was that's it? it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I think this is a really interesting point too, because there is, um, because it was, it was, I think at the time an anonymity was a, an important thing. One of my friends um, reminds me inconsistently that AA was ev- was revolutionary uh, in its time. And it was, it was a very yeah. revolutionary concept. Right. And, um, and so, and it was also a very different time, but we don't live in the thirties anymore. Like we, you know, there's a, there's been a huge shift with the information age and, and everyone has access to information and, and people are, you know, I, I think a, a lot more information is shared and people are sharing different I mean, the extent of our lives that we share on social media is, is changed dramatically. And so there's also there's this change in the way we share. And, and also this just has to be, it has to be something. I wrote, I wrote a piece called Social Proof. And, and I don't know, are you guys familiar with the concept of social proof? I'm not. Jonah, That's first I've heard of it. No. Jonah Berger's, yeah, Jonah Berger wrote a book called Contagious. And he talks about how ideas catch on. And one of the ideas that he talks about is social proof. And so it's this idea, like when you saw these people wearing yellow live strong bracelets, a bunch of people, you know, like it showed people like cancer awareness. So when, when, when you, you know, like uh, Apple flipped their logo on their laptops, right? Like this is the idea when people see other people doing something, they tend to copy yeah. that. Like it's mm-hmm. why like white headphones are such a big deal. It's why like people go into a restaurant that's full of people and not the restaurant that has one person sitting, you know, like one person in it. It's this mm-hmm. concept that when we see other people doing something, we tend to feel safe and feel like mm-hmm. that's it and mm-hmm. emulate this behavior. Okay. And so one of the real big thorns in the side of this an- anonymous piece is that we don't see our, where our, our people are. We don't see people in real life mm-hmm. that are sober. We don't see mm-hmm. people in real life that mm-hmm. have, you know, like struggled with addiction. And mm-hmm. so we have mm-hmm. no Nobody to, and we have to, the only way we find out, you know, for instance, I was at a conference a year ago and I was sitting with my girlfriend, Laura, who's very out and we were sitting there and, and this girl was, uh, we told her um, how we knew each other and we just like, so Bridie came up in the first few sentences and she was seven years sober and she goes, I'm sober too. I don't tell anybody though. She'd been sober mm-hmm. for seven years and she hadn't, she hadn't shown anybody mm-hmm. or told anybody. She doesn't feel safe like in her public life, right? She doesn't feel safe talking about it. Yeah. And so I think that this is one of these things so when we see other people struggling with something, we tend to like, not only like we have, we actually start to have role models and yeah. we also, and people we can emulate and people we can, we can find to talk to about this thing. Um, yeah. No, thank it, you for it, that. Thank you. I like that it, social proof. That's great. And, you know, and, and since I, you know, when I was, I left home early, you know, and so I, I met all kinds of people. I've seen the, the shifts and attitudes toward gay people. I mean, not with everyone, you know, it's it, developmental levels have different relations to it, but at least the, the modern to postmodern is like, oh, you're gay. Well, great. So what, you know, and uh, uh, I remember there was this thing, this old grumpy old former female tennis player. Uh, in Australia just started going and all the women on the professional team, they're all a bunch of lesbians and John McEnroe got on there and did this thing. And it was on YouTube says, who gives a fuck, <laughs> you know, and you know, and what if 50% who gives a fuck and what if they all are, I mean, who gives a fuck, you know, it's, it's nice that it's gotten to that point where, uh, you know, uh, young people, you know, can just accept people uh, for being, and, and I don't know if it's like that, everywhere but i would think in 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 yeah yeah i would think in, i would think in boulder and in san francisco and in maybe los angeles or different places it's uh it's it's a little better and, and it's that way because some people were brave at the beginning and they came out super and, brave super brave so you know we're still very much at the <clears throat> we're still very much at the leading edge of this thing. The shame and social stigma around addiction is still very much yeah, in place yeah. in a lot of places and in this country too. And the article that came out in National Geographic talking about the science of this thing is doing wonderful things. All of us by showing up here and being out with it are at the leading edge of doing something really, really important, but it's still not as widely accepted for everyone yet because some people certainly still do view it as a moral failing or a character failing or something like that. We're starting to change that. Now we have the wonderful advantage too that this doesn't have to take as long now to be as accepted because of all the technological technological and cultural shifts that have happened recently. Look at, for example, the progress that has been made and the rapidity with which people have begun to accept and understand the idea of transgender 
compared to how long it took for the same acceptance to happen for the gay movement, the homosexual exactly. movement. It's um, such a good point. We can we can do this thing quickly if we band together because of the connected nature of the world we live in, and that's a beautiful call to be courageous and start to own who we are, especially for those of us who struggled to own who we are for so many years. Right. I think it's interesting because there's this idea that there still is a very, like, it's funny because my mom, for instance, still has this idea. Um, I'm not like, I have a very big thing. I correct my sister and my mom or anybody really when I hear them, when people call people addicts, because I think like, it's just like, even, I don't know if you guys saw that the AP changed their style guide and, and alcohol, like labeling people as alcoholics and addicts has actually been, been uh, stated as something in the style guide is, is not to do. It's more, it's to, uh, it's been replaced by referring to people as somebody that struggles or somebody that struggled with addiction or somebody <clears throat> anyway. But I think it's one of these things that like, even my mom who knows like, like, listens to my podcast, reads my blogs, um, she'll refer to somebody else as an addict, right? Like she'll refer to like her friend's grandson or somebody that has struggled with like, um, uh, I don't know, meth or heroin or something and say, well, no, 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 he's an addict, but, but you're not. And so I think that there still is like when, like we still ha live in a society that still like um, you know, my sister is super progressive. She works in a prison, like she helps make educational plans within the juvenile detention system. She's part of Black Lives Matter, white people for Black Lives Matter. Um, she's just like, she's so progressive. And then, you know, she just last week referred to her, her one of her students' mother as drug addict and, and as if that explained everything. And so it's one of these things also, we, we are so socially conditioned to, to, to write people off as, as just, and, and expect a word to explain everything about that, that woman, that right. woman, that drug addict mother. Um, and so I think it's a different challenge. Um, I do think it's a very different challenge. I, I, I don't know why I haven't really wrapped my head around it, but I think it's going to be much harder than, um, I think it's going to be harder in some way than, than homosexuality or LGBT. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's been an interesting uh, experience for me coming into my own relationship to addiction in midlife is that uh, prior to that, my training in psychology, uh, you know, you'll hear shorthand used for psychological diseases, for example, calling somebody schizophrenic. But honestly, if you get into psychology training, that's not the way you talk about people. You say that they, they have had, they talk about it as a disease. I have had cancer. I have had autism, yep. I have had addiction, but it's never wedded to the personality. And so if, if it's used at all, which is rare, it's always with the sense of holding it lightly. And so when I came into the community and now I'm to introduce myself as, hi, I'm Bob, I'm an alcoholic. It runs against all of my training, which separates that from something about my, who I am as a person. And it looks at it more as in this circumstance, I look uh, I operate with borderline behavioral personalities. You don't, you know, uh, with borderline behavior characteristics, you don't call somebody a borderline. You say they have borderline features in this circumstance. Most, most people in certain circumstances will, will pathology will come up, but to label that person as once and for all, that really flies in the face of contemporary clinical psychology. So it's been a very hard adjustment to me. I really like that you're working on, on different ways of expressing this. And I feel the same way. It's so politically incorrect in the 12 step program to come up with some other language, but I find it really aversive to me and only well, ever have. Well, how about this? Uh, you know, the, the developmentalist from Sam Keen, I believe, not Sam Keen, it was from Harvard. Uh, anyway, uh, I think Ken Keen wrote books about men and other things. But this guy says, you know, he says that when. Robert Keegan? Keegan, thank you. Thank you. Robert Keegan. And, and he said, you know, what happens in, de in development is that the subject of the last uh, of the last level becomes the object of the next. Now, I think if you're, you know, you're walking around and all you do is do heroin 24 hours, you know, a day and you're, you're just about to die. And that's, you know, you're just in that thing. I think it's really uh, accurate to say he's a heroin addict. However, when you get beyond that and the drug is no longer controlling your uh, amygdala and your neocortex and every action, you actually gain back and say, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm John and, and, and I have an addiction. It's an object that's been owned. It's been accounted for, but it's no longer the controlling subject. And so in mm -hmm. what we want to do in, in recovery is to make that no longer the controlling subject. Now, my big 
awful secret was that I hid for years and never talked about any of my closest friends is I was in a religious cult for about 10 years from about 14 to 20, well, 23 actually. And, you know, I just never talked. And it wasn't until I got into therapy school where I was learning to be a therapist that we, you mean, we got to talk about this. And uh, I started coming out with it and, um, you know, and, and, I was in a religious cult and it's a very addictive thing. And I've seen it. It actually killed my brother. He was part of it and he committed suicide eventually the shame and the, just the mind screwing and the soul screwing that goes on in these organizations. So I'm very sensitive to that, but I'm, I'm definitely not there anymore, but it's, it's, it's a part that I'm willing to acknowledge now. And it's not really a, you know, a great prideful thing. And I was in a cult, you know, yuck, but I certainly, it certainly has shaped my, my values as far as freedom and individual choice and honoring people and languaging stuff and finding a, a religious path or not spiritual path, I should say, that's not dogmatic, you know, that's, that's discovery related, that's revelatory personal, and it can be shared with others. So it's really shaped a lot of my writing and my lighting thinking that, that those particular 10 years of my life and all I, I, the way I saw people getting hurt and the way I eventually came out of it and how I tried to, you know, restructure my life around that. John, you said a word there that I think is really important too in determining the origin of this stigma, which is that of choice. Um, a lot of people still view addiction as a choice. You can just choose not to use drugs. You can just choose not to drink. And sure. that's why it's different than, say, homosexuality or something like that, that we have pretty well established you're, you're born with. You didn't have a choice about. And so it becomes okay. A lot of... Uh, other psychological disorders, we assume that it's just because of your biological, your genetics, the way you were born. And so there's less judgment about that. But addiction, people still view as a weakness, as a failing, as something you can just stop or never have started in the first place. And the fact that you chose it is an issue with your character. And that's something that we really need to work, work to change. And that's why the work that that we're doing and Holly, that you're, that you're doing are such important PR for this movement in general to help change the the cultural understanding of how people got started in this in the first place and what our lives are like and can be like now whether it is a part of our history or not you know something uh, yesterday in the group that i led at the treatment center i brought in that issue holly of the national geographic science of addiction and i looked at the group it was 18 addicts in recovery and and i'm one of them and I said, what do you guys know about the science of addiction? And what was so fucking cool, you guys, is that the group began to provide the information that was in the article. They know this stuff. It's so heartening to me. It's so heartening to me that they're coming from a perspective that can actually, uh, it, like what you're saying, Doug, they can find something uh, as, a, as, a, as a legitimate response to somebody that says, just, so, just say no, Holly. Just say no, Bob. Well, you know what? It's a little bit more complicated than that, and here's why. I was really impressed by that. It came from the group itself, so I feel like that's moving in the right direction, empowering people to have a response inside to their own self-shaming messages, but also to the stigma around. It's like, no, I'm not going to buy that hype. Mm -mm, nope. Mm -mm. So interesting when you talk about choice. I mean, obviously, there's there's such a such a vast uh, amount of different things that contribute to why somebody will use whatever substance or behavior Absolutely. they use. But I think something really interesting when we talk about choice is the the world that we live in and the messages that we receive from a very young age. And just about alcohol, you just take alcohol and look at that mm -hmm. specifically. It's a rite of passage. Everyone is expected to do it. A normal right. person can tolerate it. Um, abnormal people can't tolerate it. You don't know whether or not you're normal or abnormal until you try it. You're expected to try it. Um, and if you can't handle it, there's something wrong with you. And also you did it to yourself. And so <laughs> it's this like situation that's set up just around alcohol specifically. There's, you know, I don't know if you guys caught this, but there was a study released in the last month that showed that women, uh, the addiction rates of alcohol uh, with women had doubled, like gone up by 82% in a 10 year period. And if you look at any sort of like, if you look at, um, if you just look at the hashtag bros day all day, there's that there is a women wear t-shirts now, they do yoga and they drink, Lululemon made a beer. Women are constantly giving, you know, like there's pink mm -hmm. Jack Daniels, you guys, pink Jack Daniels. 
we're marketed this vision, this idea that like women drink. And yeah. so what we're seeing is women's, <clears throat> the addiction rate with women is increasing for, or with alcohol is increasing dramatically. Yeah. And so when we talk about choice, like how much choice is wrapped if wrapped up in something where there's a billion dollar marketing, you know, machine. And now we're part of that because we're wearing yeah. the marketing materials. We're posting memes that say Rose all day and we're showing pictures of ourselves drinking rose rose popsicles. Um and you know, and it's nor it's so normalized. We're part of this machine. Like how much choice is actually involved when we're told we should be able to handle it and that that not only that consuming it belligerently is actually normal. Yeah. And there's something wrong with you if you're not in, if you're not part of that or you're yeah. a downer if you think that it's yeah. you know it's just yeah. Yeah. um it's it's H uh, Holly do you think it's a marketing the marketing uh is one of the major factors that accounts for that increase in alcoholism among oh, women Oh hell yes. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean I get it. Is, is, there, is there something else? Normal. Everything yeah. is solved with a bottle of wine. There are so many memes out there right now that show women as the so like that normalize okay. that normalize addiction. It's yeah. ethanol. It's rocket fuel. It's a drug. Like alcohol yeah. is the only drug that is not counted as a drug. Yeah, that's it's crazy. Yeah. And it's yeah. normalized, and we're expected yeah. to consume it. Yeah. And not yeah. only that, there is this like almost violent campaign out there that that is showing that like women's empowerment comes from the consumption of it. Yeah. And so, absolutely, I would say uh, I would stake. Mm. I mean. There is, of course, the social pressures of being a woman, right? Like my friend Christy Coulter wrote, Coulter wrote this really fantastic article about, like, of course we're getting drunk all the time. Look at our lives. Look at what's yeah. expected of us. Yes. You know, look at what, yeah. like, post-feminism has done to us. Like, we're expected to, you know, what? Like, be, you know, have, be the CEO and, and like, keep our husbands happy and make dinner and, and make our homes look like, you know, something out of, like, the... And, and take care of the kids. <laughs> and take care of the kids and you know and I'll, and and still have like you know our, our nice tits and good faces at age 50 yeah. i mean like of course women are drinking so there's like that part of it there's so much pressure like mm -hmm. on on women but there's also the, so there's the, the pressure that is sold to us to be everything and then there's the solution that's sold yeah. to us yeah. and yeah. we're selling it to each other we're actually using social media to sell it to each other mm -hmm. like life should look like this and here is how you handle life. Yeah. And so it's just like, of mm. course, like I'm surprised mm. it only went up by, a, you know, 80%. I, I would have <laughs> put like, you know, 500%. <laughs> it comes back to the social proof that you were talking about earlier. We see everybody else right. doing it and we think that it's normal. Of course it's we okay. think that's normal. And then when we're sitting at home and we're like, oh my God, I had a bottle of wine again by myself. Is that normal? And then we look around and we look for people like to give us that like confirmation bias. Yeah, of course yeah, you're normal. Yeah, you don't yeah, have to worry, yeah, honey. Like it's yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's normal and you can worry. Yeah. Unfortunately it happens a lot. Um, I, I wanted to, um, uh, uh, two points. Well, one point, I, I think the, the practice that we both kind of stumbled on at the same time, you know, the physical practice, um, I think that may be the bridge between addicts and so-called non-addicts because we're all messed up. We all suffer, you know, whether it's, it's a compulsive disorder or it's depression or bad ideas about ourselves, or we just never realize our gifts and never, you know, we just live at a level that's so uh, below what we could contribute to the world um, that the practice itself you know, we talk more about the practice and more about getting well and staying well in all four quadrants, all lines, all the things that we're talking about. And the current book I'm writing is just that. We're taking all the things that we learn from um, from integral recovery and the practices and applying it to everyone, you know. So whether you're an addict or not, it, it's the, the evolution of the individual and our society and the hard work. You know, it takes practice. And we never really realized all we had to do all the things that were included in being an actualized human being, and now we do. And I think it started off, well, at least in my life, because the addicts were the squeaky wheels. I mean, they needed help now, but we all need help. We all need the same thing. And it's really fun to, and I realized that when I was talking to, to families of, of 
of you know the addicts or the identified patients, it was obvious they all need to be doing it. And, I, and as much as possible, I got everybody meditating, everybody doing the work, doing the yoga, doing the, the, the practices. And so I think that's the next. Uh, and I want to get these guys. <laughs> we're gonna. We have a couple of projects to do before Pam lets us do the next podcast because we have so much fun doing this. But uh, so we have some unfun <laughs> things to do to get to get to that. And I also wanted to ask you, tell us about your hip sobriety program. What are you doing? And yeah, is, it, well, I, is it mainly for women or, or can we all join or what's up? You kind of have to be, if you're a dude, then you got to be kind of dude that likes a chick like me. So, I mean, it's <laughs> okay. like, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so I think like just stepping back, <laughs> I do think that's such an important point. I love this. Like, I think that for me, the best thing that ever happened to me was that it, the pain was so sharp. Right. Like I think everybody eventually there's this, this quote from a course in miracles that like, it just is how much pain can you tolerate before you actually give in and say uncle. And I think that for, for when you're in addiction, the pain is so intense. You, you surrender, you are, your hand is forced. Not everybody, you know, like people can write it out right until death. Right. But I think that there is like this idea, like the, in addiction, your hand is so painful that you will do something to change. Yeah. It is, there's so much pain. Most people live in this, like, in this, like, numb, in this, like, dull, aching pain. Um, yeah. And maybe it's not so, like, you know, like, I, my, I felt like my skin was coming off when, yeah. when I started my yeah. path. I actually fell on my knees. Yeah. But a lot of people, maybe their skin isn't burning off, but they're just, you know, in this, like, ugh. and so I think that's one of the the most fortunate pieces of like, I I always talk to people that I work with and I just, am like, you're lucky. Like everyone's going to have to do this at some point. Get it. Yeah. Everybody Mm -hmm. is going to have to do this work at some point and maybe not in this lifetime, but they're going to come back and try it again and again and again. Your invitation is here. This is your invitation to actually wake up to this life that you are in. Um, and so like the hero's journey, right? Like it's, you know, we're, we're all called. It's just when, when we actually, you know, take ourselves on that journey. Um, Hip Sobriety is a program that I founded. Like I started, my blog is called Hip Sobriety, but it is for me, I started to really speak to a different population. 51 million people are uh, problematic drinkers. I specifically work with alcohol, just to be clear. Um, 51 million people are problematic drinkers. Uh, 5 million of them are classified in, in DSM-4 language as addicted. Um, the other 46 million are uh, just in the spectrum. And right. so there is a very large number of people in the United States alone that have that fit this bill of like, uh, I am, uh, I'm sick, but maybe I'm not one of them. And so, uh, I have created a voice that is on one hand convincing, just saying like, look around you and look at this bullshit we are being fed. Is this, is this normal to you that we have to end our night numbing out, you know? And like, and so like really like, like promoting this idea that alcohol is, is not great you guys you know like alcohol (laughs) may not be the thing um and that it's not that it's not normal to drink i have this very strong loud message that alcohol is not the normal like actually showing up your life is normal and so and then i also have this other concept that that is that is um that is uh communicated through my blog which is um take your recovery into your own hands project manage your own recovery Mm -hmm. i mean then hip sobriety and then i have a program called hip sobriety school which is an eight-week program that brings people into community and then walks them through uh eight weeks worth of a well-rounded uh holistic recovery building like i'm not Mm -hmm healing them you know i'm just (laughs) giving them the tools for them to heal themselves and empowering them and giving them a much different message most people don't want to end up with the other people i spent my whole life like i was i started out as an outsider i spent my whole life fearing that i would one day not be able to drink and therefore would, would be one of those people one of those sad people that had to leave the party and so for me, what I really try and create is this idea that you guys, this is this, this aversive thing to do. This is where your life starts. This is actually the party, like this right here. Um, and so we create this really strong foundation that like, 
like that this is the best thing that could have happened to you and I'm going to show you how to make the best of it and in a way that is super empowering and evolutionary that will carry you through the rest of your life and we use the integral map we talk about like the integral map is the thing that guides it I don't talk about personality types I, I don't get into like intelligences I just do it real simple I'm just like here is uh, a talk with a nutritionist, upper right, okay? Like get your home in order, put some plants around your home. Um, you know, like maybe like um, get a meditation corner, that's your lower right. Um, let's uh, meditate and also I'm, let's do some positive psychology, there's your upper left and let's all hang out together and talk about it, there's your lower left. And like that's your, like that's your foundation. You just start there and you start adding bits and pieces because most people come into this and they're perfectionist extremists and they're like, I want to do all the things. I'm going to meditate, you know, and then it blows up and then <laughs> they can't do all the things. Yeah. And so this is, a, I present it in a very, like in an overwhelming way. I give them too much content, but in a way where they're like allowed to, if they just pick three or four things, just like yeah. start to create ritual, just yeah. start to, you know, and also the, like I give them the knowledge to understand why it matters. And then yeah. they start making small changes and you know how it goes. You make these small changes, you start believing in yourself and then you start to evolve through it. And before you know it, you're, you know, like I just got my credit, like just it's five years now, right? It'll be five years since I started this path in October. Mm -hmm. It'll be five years sober in April straight from, from alcohol. Mm -hmm. And for me, I just got my, um, my credit score just went into the seven. It just went into the green zone. Um, <laughs> and I just got my IRS notice that I paid off all like, mm -hmm. I mean, I like yeah. the money stuff. Awesome. I'm just getting awesome. a handle on the money stuff. I yeah. just went to the dentist for the first time, mm -hmm. um, in years yesterday. Mm -hmm. And my mouth is yeah. a fucking mess. Like I've got, yeah. like, I was a former bulimic, you know? And so, yeah. but that's yeah. just one of these things. Yes. You're just picking the stuff off. And it's not a matter of, about being perfect. It's just a matter of starting to move through the things that oppress you. And, and, and yeah. also like, you know, not to like, you know, be the Martha Stewart of your life, but really just to be somebody that can, can create a, just, it's about creating a life you don't need to escape from and doing the things that you have to do. Creating a life you don't need to escape from. Love that. Love that. Maybe that's a good place uh, to wrap this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Holly, we got to have you back. And also mm -hmm. when we start our, our, uh, integral, um, uh, transformational practice uh, podcast. We'd like to have you there too, because you know the important thing about this 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 kind of work is for everyone. And the really groovy thing is we can start kids doing that. Maybe they'd never have to become addicts. Wouldn't that be fun? Children need this more than yeah. anybody, right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. where we got to start. It's really, really one of the areas that's so so desperately overlooked. Mm -hmm. Kids. Brilliant, Holly. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> you guys, this is so great. I love talking to you. Anyway, thank, thank you for you. having me on. Yeah, it's beautiful to see you, Holly. Thank you so much. Many thank blessings. You guys have a great day. You Thanks. too. Bye bye. Bye.